the bandit, the builder. One is a thief, something of a scoundrel, a jack of all trades. The other is an architect, a workaholic, and a family man. The raccoon and the beaver, two of North America's most popular wildlife characters. One has become famous for looting, the other for engineering. But these reputations are only a small part of the story. What are they doing the rest of the time? How do they raise their families? Our film looks at the fortunes of two families whose lifestyles could not be more different. Raccoon and the Beaver. Two success stories that could not be more different. Both make their living in the forests of North America. But while they share the same forest, their respective talents lead them to almost opposite lifestyles. It's spring in southern Canada, and the forest is still bound in snow. But the raccoon is out and about. He doesn't hibernate and can hardly wait for the snow to disappear. Even on sunny days, the frozen crust is hard to dig in, hampering his light-fingered way of finding food. He keeps on the move, wandering the woods alone in a constant search for something to eat. A female keeps to her sheltered den in a hollow tree, and with good reason. Inside is her litter of two-ounce cubs, born a couple of months after a brief liaison with the male. They'll grow up under her care, never knowing their father. The ice has broken on the pond and a beaver is already at work gathering material for spring renovations. After long months sealed in under the ice, the male beaver is ready to resume the construction projects that kept his family safe all winter. He'll have dams to repair, canals to dig, and improvements to make to the family lodge. Entering the lodge from one of its several underwater openings, the male joins his family, who are snug and dry on the wooden bedding inside. The freeze is over, and soon there'll be thousands of travelers along the beaver's waterways. Canada geese, they arrive with a fanfare on their migration to summering grounds in the north. Within the flock, the geese fly in pairs, each close to its lifetime mate. Most 
of the geese will rest and feed, then move on. But some live here all year round, residents of the southern Canadian beaver ponds. The woods are still leafless, but the resident chickadees are already staking a claim to the best nesting sites. Soon warblers, wrens, sparrows, and others will be arriving, and it's first come, first served. The male raccoon, always hungry, investigates the backwaters with gusto. He's been living off his body fat for most of the winter and is ready for a good meal. The swampy, standing waters impounded by the beavers are a perfect pantry for the raccoon. His sensitive five-fingered hands grope for snails, slugs, worms, and other delicacies. there are insect grubs in a dead tree or mushroom sprouting. Maybe there are mussels in the water or frog's eggs. The raccoon will scour his square mile patch looking for anything to eat, animal or vegetable, dead or alive. On a dry spot above the meltwater, a resident pair of Canada geese is nesting. This will interest the raccoon, for a goose egg or two or three would make a terrific meal. however, is a formidable guardian, large and loud. The ruckus alerts the gander, double trouble for the raccoon. The geese aren't bluffing. Their beating wings can deliver painful blows. Outnumbered and outmaneuvered, the would-be bandit makes his getaway. The warmth and light of longer days have reached the forest floor. Trilliums tilt their heads to face the sun. Orchids and buttercups flower. The beaver pond is free of ice and back in running order. The dam is in good repair and the beaver inspects his pond with satisfaction. He's made additions to the lodge, and inside, there's a new addition to the family.
Beavers are strictly vegetarian, and while the female tends to the new kit, the male keeps her supplied with greenery. Tender aspen leaves are a favorite. Baby beavers are perfect miniatures of their parents. They're born with a full coat of fur, eyes open, and they're able to move around the inside of the lodge immediately. But they are not allowed out for several weeks. The father is on guard and often checks to make sure the kid is all right. Satisfied, he leaves. A moment too soon. Actually, the kid is able to swim, but cannot yet close off his nose and ears like the adults. And his fluffy baby fur makes him too buoyant to dive. The mother seemed to take for granted that the male would come to the rescue. But since beavers mate for life, they know each other pretty well. Finally, she checks him over. He seems a bit subdued by the ordeal, but he'll soon be eager to go out and play. The male continues on his inspection tour around the pond and locates his older offspring, a yearling, who's busy snacking on leaves. Beavers live in extended families, and young typically stay with their parents for at least two years. They all work together to maintain the family compound. Inside the hollow tree den, the raccoon cubs are growing. In contrast to the beaver kit, these babies were born blind and completely helpless. They won't open their eyes until they're three weeks old, at which time they'll begin to walk and climb. Soon after, they'll be ready to leave the den. Until then, their mother can't stray far to forage and must eat whatever she can find close by. A different mother in a tree nearby is luckier. A wood duck prepares to lead her chicks out into the world. Even though her eggs hatched only a day ago, it's time for them to leave. She doesn't feed them, and they must go out to eat. The merganser and her brood also cruise the ponds and streams. The extensive waterworks engineered by the beavers create these places for many other creatures to live.
The Canada goslings now make their noisy debut. They're being taken for their first swim. Both parents are on hand for the launching. But the wood duck must supervise her brood all by herself. Danger is never far away. A snapping turtle is a silent submarine predator of ducklings. Just in time, the wood duck leads her chicks out of harm's way. Summer has finally arrived in these watery woods, and the trees are decked out in green. Everywhere, chicks are calling out for food and parents are working overtime. The demanding cries of the chicks are also heard by their predators, including the wandering male raccoon. He's a good climber and a crafty nest robber. Spotting a robin's nest with nobody home, he makes an easy raid. Raccoons are really most active at night, and he'll continue to forage long after dark. In the tree den, the cubs are restless. Their mother decides it's time for their first excursion. One by one, they follow her out into the summer night. She won't leave them far. It's a first lesson in climbing and gaining confidence in the dark. They're a little wobbly, but doing just fine for their first time out.
The last cub, however, has ideas of his own. Instead of climbing up with the rest of the cubs, he heads down to explore away from the tree. But a great horned owl is watching and listening. The rest of the cubs have had their first lesson about the dangers that lurk in the dark. All night, the male beaver patrols the pond, ready to add any necessary touches to his buildings. The female and the yearling are inside, keeping an eye on the kit. Actually, beavers' eyes are designed for day vision. It's thought they've become nocturnal animals to avoid humans, their most serious predators. The raccoon is a night wanderer by nature. He follows a regular route through his stretch of woods and waterways, searching every nook and cranny along his trail. Raccoon originated from the Native American word Arukan, meaning he who scratches with his hands. And he uses those dexterous forepaws exactly like hands. They're equipped with thumbs and little fingers for grasping, and their delicate sense of touch allows him to hunt for food without even looking. Like many fur-bearing animals that were decimated in the 18th and 19th centuries, the raccoon has made an extraordinary comeback. In recent years, it has been expanding its range northward as land has been cleared for agriculture. The key to its success is adaptability. The raccoon has a talent for taking advantage of human neighborhoods. Garbage is one of its favorite foods, and if invited, it will move right into your house. Cubs have become quite a handful, and it takes constant foraging to keep them fed.
The cubs pay close attention to everything their mother does, especially to all the things she eats. The white-tailed deer has brought her fawn to the pond for a drink, not expecting a gang of raccoons to show up. The cubs have many things to learn, but the knack of dabbling their paws into any water they find is just second nature to them. In fact, the water feels like a second home. seems to realize that his pond has been invaded. Young raccoon retreats quickly. And the beaver makes a loud announcement that this is his pond. With their keen sense of smell, the female and the kit sniff out the intruders. A beaver's nose is so sensitive it can smell a stand of poplar trees 200 yards away. The scent of a raccoon is no cause for real alarm. The cub finds his way back to the family and they all set off together to explore more of the forest. The beavers are content to remain in their pond, secure in their sense of property and their rights of ownership. The lone male raccoon also comes to the water's edge and he's searching for something specific. Snapping turtles bury their eggs on the bank and the raccoon is determined to find them. crushing bite, but it doesn't discourage a bold raccoon. Another successful raid for the bandit. Raccoons take about a quarter of the turtle eggs each year. 
Midsummer, a time of plenty on the beaver ponds. Cattails mature in the shallow waters and ripple like waves in the wind. The Canada Goose family, all looking like adults now, graze in a meadow that replaced a beaver pond when the beavers moved on. Milkweed plants thrive on this opened up land, providing food in turn for the caterpillar of the monarch butterfly. Milkweed is full of noxious chemicals which discourage most insects but the caterpillar consumes them and becomes poisonous itself. Its bright colors are a warning to any would-be caterpillar eaters. The monarch is on a tight schedule. After about 10 days of eating, the caterpillar pupates, preparing for its glorious transformation. Monarchs that emerge in late summer are called the autumn generation, and they will make an epic journey, unmatched by any other butterfly. They flit from flower to flower, collecting sugars to fatten up for the trip. Then they will fly 2,000 miles to California and Mexico for the winter. The male raccoon must consider the coming winter, too. He inspects a hollow tree as a prospective den. He doesn't truly hibernate, but he'll need a place to hole up in really bad weather. He discovers a cache of acorns, probably the hard work of a squirrel. And, of course, he steals them. He needs to overeat to fatten up on the rich harvest of autumn fruits in order to make it through the coming winter. The female and her cubs are busy fattening up too, pouncing on the countless frogs in the beaver ponds. They're also practicing to be thieves, stealing from each other instead of catching their own. The male nervously tests the same waters. He risks a confrontation with the female who has no interest in sharing the pond.
Never at a loss for long, the male discovers an apple tree, and it's full of ripe fruit. This is a gold mine. He should be careful not to give its location away. Luckily, the family is too preoccupied to notice. He struggles to reach more apples. It appears that his efforts to fatten up have been quite successful. His vantage point in the tree gives the male early warning of approaching danger, a coyote. The coyote is one of the raccoon's few remaining natural enemies and its numbers are increasing in the absence of the wolf and the bear. The safest escape route is straight up. The coyote can smell them, but he can't follow them up the tree. The raccoons wait until nightfall before they feel it's safe to come down. The male has been hiding in his apple tree all this time, and once the coast is clear, he too comes down. At dawn, the Canada geese wing in from the north. Their Arctic breeding grounds have already frozen over, and they're heading south. They drop down to rest and feed before moving on.
The beaver family is building a new compound for the winter. Evidence of their logging operation is everywhere. With their long front teeth, they can whittle away at trees of any size. The work itself keeps the teeth sharpened like a chisel. There's a good food supply at the edge of the new pond, but the water level needs to be deeper for the beavers to store enough branches below the surface to last for the winter. The male inspects his new waterway and discovers that it's crossed by one of the raccoon's trails. The question of ownership is raised, and this calls for a meeting. They seem to reach an agreement. The raccoon will come and go as he pleases, free to search for food along the water's edge. The beaver will remain patrolling the waters and supervising stream flow and pond size. the beaver heads back to work. His influence extends far into the forest. The water he impounds drowns trees, opening up the canopy and making way for new plants. It's the hard work he puts in on his dams and channels that prevents streams from drying out and creates lakes for geese, ducks, fish, raccoons, and many others. The beaver is the builder, the master architect of this landscape. The colors of autumn include the cold, dark gray of an approaching storm. Heavy rains can mean trouble at the beaver dam. At the sound of rushing water, the beaver steams across the pond to check for damage. The dam's been breached. He'll have to make extensive repairs. But instead of going straight to work, he heads for the lodge, seemingly unconcerned about the danger to his pond.
Indeed, the whole family seems remarkably calm about the calamity occurring outside. Actually, they're making important preparations for the work ahead. It's essential for beavers to waterproof their fur in order for them to stay warm and dry when in cold water. This means a good grooming with an application of a special oil they excrete from a gland in their abdomen. Once his fur is properly coated, he's ready to tackle the repairs. Kit comes out, but doesn't know quite how to help. The male struggles to shovel up leaves and mud for mortar. The kit begins to get the idea. It's a small contribution, but it's well received. His father lets the kit make a real effort to help. The dam is secure. It will hold back the water once more and the pond will be restored. No other animals apart from man control their environment to the same extent as beavers. Like raccoons, beavers don't hibernate. Their engineering provides a solid, well-protected home that will keep them warm all winter. While the beavers keep to their winter retreat, the male raccoon makes his solitary way through the first snow. He continues to forage. Unlike the beavers who have stored an ample supply of food, the raccoon lives hand to mouth and always on the move. It seems a hard life, but it suits him.
His travels take him to the base of a large tree, where he finds something very interesting, a young female starting her first winter alone. She seems eager for company and comes down to join him. The two go off to his log shelter. They'll spend a short time getting acquainted before she makes the decision to mate and he decides to leave her for his solitary wandering life again. Winter settles in to stay, and within the frozen forest, the bandit and the builder, the opportunist and the engineer, dream their separate dreams. One of all the things that he can get, the other of all the things he must do.